Thanks very much, Bob, Greg, uh, for that introduction. You gave about half my, I'm looking at the screen because you're there, you gave about half my talk uh, already, so I appreciate um, that. I'm really pleased to, uh, to be here as part of this series, and thanks to Ellen Bell for helping um, set it up. Uh, it's an important conversation, uh, and uh, let's see how I can kick it off. Can we get there from here? Maybe. I'm done. Uh, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll fill out the, the middle a little bit. Um, we have a lot of challenges. Um, we have a lot to learn um, on transportation and climate adaptation. Uh, and I'm going to help frame what kind of problems we're facing, what solutions we know about, and some of our needs going forward. Um, just to tell you where I'm coming from, the Center for Clean Air Policy is a think tank headquartered in Washington, D.C. I actually work from home in, in Montreal. Uh, and we do work around the world, primarily with government clients, uh, helping uh, policy design and analysis, often with public-private stakeholder uh, dialogues around emission reduction, uh, big focus on uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well as air pollution. Uh, some cross-cutting themes in our work, certainly on greenhouse gas emission reduction in the past about seven years, looking at climate adaptation, uh, and focusing on public-private collaboration, because neither sector can do it on their own, either implement policy or build infrastructure. So that's important for my work in urban areas, obviously that national, local coordination uh, is important. So these multiple dimensions make it more challenging and sometimes more fun. And also maximizing economic and social benefits, not just because it sounds good, but because actually we're not going to get implementation unless there's really buy-in uh, on the benefits. Um, a few of our, our efforts, uh, most of our work right now is in developing countries. Our main initiative is called MAIN, uh, Mitigation Action Implementation Network, working with countries in Latin America and <coughs> Asia on policy design, trying to come up with uh, major transformative sectoral policies, transportation, energy, waste, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve uh, economic development. Uh, U.S. Climate Policy Initiative has existed for uh, about at least 15 years in different formats. Again, a public-private dialogue looking at policy and design issues right now focusing on energy efficiency, combined heat and power. Speaking about 15 years, next week will be my 15-year anniversary uh, at CCAP, so I remember we've had that, these dialogues going on for a while. And my sustainable transportation work in the last couple of years is focused on developing countries. Really exciting work down in Colombia on transit-oriented development, bringing together different national and local ministries, uh, trying to get climate, international climate funding uh, to support those policies and some of the work in a couple other countries. Uh, the adaptation work right now is under the rubric for our Weathering Climate Risks program with my colleague uh, Shana Yudvardi, who's on the, on the webinar line. Um, that was uh, launched that with Dr. Kelly Klima, who's now at Carnegie Mellon. Um, in the last year, we've been focusing on resilience planning in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> Big focus on bringing together stakeholders and, importantly, having the private sector there in the beginning uh, up front. Again, because they own a lot of infrastructure, run a lot of infrastructure, have a lot of skin in the game in terms of the economics uh, and are important uh, partners in implementation. Uh, we are looking at heat risks, flood risks, um, working with the D.C. Department of Environment, the Office of Planning, um, hoping to catalyze implementation and share lessons. Uh, with others. We're also, we've been working on a paper, I was talking to Bob about, on sort of measuring climate resilience. Not just measuring physical impacts, which are important, but measuring key milestones, measuring implementation progress, and looking at different dimensions, what we call pie, people, infrastructure, and economy. And an area that I've been sort of dabbling in and finally now digging in a bit more is this overlap between adaptation and mitigation. In English, between how do you both reduce greenhouse gas emissions and enhance resilience at the same time. There's some synergies, there's some conflicts. I'll share a little bit about that toward the end. Um, you can find, I think the presentation will be online. All the underlying things are meant to be hyperlinked, so you can find these uh, reports. I'll talk about this first uh, workshop in a moment um, on uh, identifying information and assistance needs. Um, a workshop we did also with DC on critical infrastructure resilience uh, in a book I uh, wrote with Chuck Kujian called Growing Wealthier, trying to document, document the economic uh, impacts of smart growth, transit-oriented development, green infrastructure, a couple other uh, areas. Uh, but this Ask the Climate question, which, which Greg mentioned, which actually Ron Sims and Jim Lopez, who were in King County at that point, coined, uh, is really the framing we've approached this issue with. And basically saying, what we build, where and how, makes a big impact. 
both on emissions, whether we're talking about buildings or transportation, as well as resilience uh, or vulnerability to climate impacts. So ask the climate question when you're making that kind of decision. If it's an infrastructure divest investment, if it's a policy decision, let's just do the common sense thing and say, what are the impacts? And our partners in cities like King County, Chicago, Toronto, New York City, started doing that department by department. And of course, the federal government has been doing that in developing agency adaptation plans and basically saying, okay, what do we do now with a flood event, with an extreme heat event? And what resources do we have and what needs do we have um, going forward? 